Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Temporal Graph Reading Group uh, and restarting in the fall. Uh, so we are back for this semester. Uh, the time will still be um, for 11 a.m. Uh, um, ET time zone uh, on Thursdays. Uh, so we are very excited to have uh, Maurice Lampert uh, from, uh, from Julius Maximilian's uh, University of Wurzer uh, from Germany. Um, and uh, so I will start with some uh, speaker introduction and then we'll go to the presentation. Um, and Julia, I will make you co-host so you can add people um, while I'm talking. Uh, let me just find you. Okay, I think you're a co-host now. Um, yes, uh, so Maurice. Lampard is a PhD student at uh, the Chair of Machine Learning for Complex Networks, a Center for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science at the Julius Maximilius University uh, Wurzburg uh, under the supervision of uh, Prof. Ingo Schultz. Um, his research interests include different aspects of graph, uh, graph representation learning with a current focus on temporal graphs and applications in single cell biology. And prior to his PhD student, uh, uh, to his PhD studies, uh, he completed his master's degree at the same institution. Um, yeah, so I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, I will start my uh, screen sharing now. Okay, um, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so during the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I also have the chat open, so I'm trying to uh, see if there are any messages, but it's uh, all the way uh, back on my screen. So if I miss it, uh, please also feel free to interrupt me. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about today uh, about dynamic link prediction, as the title says. Um, but yeah. The topic is uh, why the task uh, is not actually what we should evaluating when we are training temporal GNNs uh, for to forecast future links, um, but instead uh, to use a task that we call dynamic link forecasting and we motivate this uh, using the information loss that happens in uh, dynamic link prediction. Um, a quick motivation uh, for the start. Um, so in modern data, data collection, um, more and more data is collected everywhere. Um, this is also one of the driving factors uh, in recent uh, success of uh, AI in general. And for uh, graphs or networks, this means that we can not only um, gather data for uh, graphs that scale up to millions or billions of nodes, but also can collect the timestamps um, of uh, the interactions that happen in specific systems. Um, examples include, for example, in the social sciences, um, online interactions, um, where we could um, yeah, gather the, for example, uh, music history of um, users that listen to songs, um, or gather um, proximity networks, um, which yeah, you might be familiar with from the um, contact tracing apps from the uh, recent pandemic. Other examples also include logistics, um, for example, air traffic networks or um, yeah, the routes of trains or buses. Um, yeah, you can um, have different uh, notions of these temporal graphs. There are evolving graphs and a lot of more. Um, this talk is mainly on two um, different notions. Um, one is the continuous time notions where we have um, timestamped edges. And these edges are in an ordered sequence, as you can see in the visualization below. We have a so-called time unfolded graph um, with different nodes that are duplicated um, for different timestamps, uh, and then the links uh, happen. Yeah, uh, as you can see um, between the nodes uh, of the different timestamps. Um, another notion uh, is the discrete um, temporal graphs, um, where we have snapshots of uh, and uh, in each time interval you have a um, yeah normal step graph. 
And uh, now we can go to the task. Um, first, let me introduce it, uh, which is dynamic link prediction. Um, so the task is typically that you have a history of edges that uh, up to a point T. And the goal uh, now is to find a model that can predict uh, the edges uh, for the next time step. Um, normally, this is evaluated with a, a test set. And the problem is that the data sets that we have are very large. Um, so it is not feasible uh, to yeah, evaluate this for each next time step um, uh, sequentially, but it's uh, much um, easier uh, to do it in batches um, because then it's much faster. Um, to do this, uh, the task is normally simplified. Um, so instead of um, predicting for the next time step, we predict for the next B occurring edges, um, regardless of their exact time that when they occur. Uh, you can see this in the uh, visualization on the right, um, where instead of only having the next edge, we have a few more that are predicted at the same, at the same time. And uh, yeah, this that uh, you don't really care for the time anymore uh, leads to problems. And um, yeah, now we are going to talk about these problems uh, in a little more detail. Um, we are going through them uh, based on the example you can see on the right. And the first problem is that if you divide this example into batches, um, then the window durations you get out of it um, have different uh, are differently large. So, for example, here you can see that the first batch uh, is two hours long, while the second is only one hour. Um, the third is then four hours, which I don't know could mean that there is lunch in between or something like that. And the last is again one hour. Um, this uh, is bad because, for example, if you consider um, a uh, task where you want to uh, predict uh, if a train gets cancelled or not or delayed, um, then during a day um, you would uh, consider a batch that um, yeah would have a window duration of one hour approximately. And if you would then um, continue to the night, then normally there are less trains drive, uh, driving through, through the night. So this would mean then that you would not only predict for the one hour that you would for the day, but instead predict for the whole night. So like this, the task, uh, the prediction task uh, or the forecasting task uh, is changing dynamically during um, your evaluation. At the same time, this also happens uh, if you use different batch sizes, um, because normally um, your batch size is a hyperparameter that you are tuning. Um, and you can choose a specific batch size for each model. And this would mean that uh, for if you choose a very large batch size, you could, uh, for example, in this example here on the right, um, have a batch size of seven, uh, which would make the task trivial because then you would have uh, each of the edge occurring at least once. Um, so you can just say, okay, uh, Every edge occurs, so we can just forecast every edge at every time, um, which yeah is not how it's supposed to be. Um, another point is that uh, so here I visualize it like this uh, to make uh, it easier for us to understand. Um, but the models get the batches more uh, in a visual uh, in a way that looks like this. So you don't really know when. Uh, time was that the edge occurred, uh, just the different batches. And uh, the last problem is uh, more specific for discrete time graphs, or uh, more specifically for graphs where the um, batch size is uh, smaller than the number of edges that occur at the same time, which is uh, yeah, most commonly um, the case for discrete time graphs. And in this case, then the different batches uh, would introduce an order of edges that uh, does not exist because uh, for the same timestamp you can choose uh, edges um, arbitrarily for different batches and this would mean then that the first batch the blue one um, would uh, be interpreted as the model as uh, 
the edges that occurred first and then uh, the yellow one and so on. Another problem with this is that um, the model can get glimpses of um, patterns that occur in uh, specific timestamps. Um, for example, here in this example, you can see a pattern um, that, yeah, um, from, uh, so here you can see that uh, if one node uh, is connected to the ne next node, all of the other nodes from that time step get also connected to that node. And if you then, if the model then finds this pattern and then observes uh, some of the edges in the first batch, uh, it can predict the rest of the edges pretty pretty easily, um, which is yeah not how is it how it is intended to be because in reality it would uh, need to predict all of the edges at the same time. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is just theory for now. So um, next we investigated this on uh, real world data sets. Um, these might be familiar to you, the data sets. So um, some of them are continuous, uh, others are discrete. Um, for example, the Enron data set is uh, email communications uh, and so on. And we investigated all of these data sets on first uh, edge occurrence patterns. So are the edges uh, uniformly distributed over the time or are there specific temporal patterns in the data? Uh, next, we also looks, looked at how the window durations look. And lastly, we looked uh, at the information loss that occurs if you choose uh, specific batch sizes um, for these data sets. So let's start with the edge occurrence. Here you can see um, histograms of each of the continuous time data sets. Um, where on the x-axis uh, is the time, and on the y-axis is the number of edge, uh, number of edges um, binned into six-hour intervals. And you can see that uh, for some of the data sets, especially the Enron and the UCI data set, um, the, tavern, uh, the patterns uh, diverge uh, largely. Um, you can see the, the dashed lines here. Um, this is... Uh, so the visualizations are from the paper, and uh, these mark uh, the train and the test splits and the validation split. Um, so you can see that, for example, the UCI data set um, has a very different pattern uh, in the training data set, which is the most left one, and the test set, which is the most right one. And this means that um, it also has a very different task uh, to do the model. Because uh, in the first, in the training set, uh, it's probably, I don't know, about an hour uh, that it needs to predict for. And uh, in the later stages, it would be maybe a day or something like that. So it's a completely different task. Um, we can also uh, observe this uh, when you look at the window durations. Um, here in this plot, uh, you can see the um, distribution of window durations um, for specific batch sizes. Uh, the x-axis uh, shows the batch sizes and the y-axis the durations. And uh, each um, for each batch size, um, we plotted um, all of the batch durations um, with, with a, a point with very low opacity. Um, so this means that uh, if you can see through the points uh, in the visualization, then the, um, there are very few um, batches that have that specific duration. And if you cannot see through it, then this means that uh, there are yeah, many points with exactly that duration. And uh, this shows that uh, for some of the data sets, um, the durations uh, vary for the same batch size um, pretty strongly. Uh, for example, here for last FM, you have uh, for large batch sizes uh, a lot of um, points on top of each other. Um, and yeah, we, we did the same for uh, discrete time temporal graphs, um, where you can see similar patterns. Um, and most interestingly, for um, the window durations, again, you can also see that uh, here the durations are mostly either zero or one, uh, 
which means that uh, as we expected, um, there are at least two batches um, that uh, have to contain uh, edges from the same snapshot, um, which is this uh, problem with the non-existent order that uh, gets introduced with this batching. Um, next, we looked at the information loss that occurred and we quantify it using normalized mutual information. And this metric quantifies the amount of information um, that two random variables uh, have about each other. And as random variables, we choose uh, for one variable the timestamp uh, of an edge, and as the other variable, um, the index of the batch that each edge would be assigned to. And with this, uh, we get a measure uh, on how much information um, the batch index contains about the timestamp and the other way around. Um, the values of this metric mean that uh, if you have a one, then you have perfect information, uh, which means if you have the batch index, you could perfectly predict the timestamp. And if you have a value of zero, then it would just be random guessing. Um, just a and, quick clarification question. So going yeah. back to the metric you show. So here, if you have batch size of one, then this is the MNI is guaranteed to be one, right? Um, not exactly, because um, also for continuous, uh, you can see it here. Also for continuous time graphs, um, you can have um, edges appearing at the same time. And if you would have a batch size of one, then you would um, have them uh, in a different batch, um, which would mean you could not um, predict the timestamp perfectly. I see, I see. So, okay, so actually no matter how you choose the batch size, it will never be perfect. Um, except if the data set um, has, uh, yeah, only timestamps, uh, only one, um, only distinct timestamps, let's say. Correctly. Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, and this is exactly what you can see in this visualization here. Um, so uh, especially for the NRAN data set, um, you can see that uh, the NMI never uh, is one. And uh, for most of the other data sets with increasing batch sizes, um, it yeah decreases, which means that the temporal information um, that the model gets um, through the edge order um, decreases with increasing batch size. Um, the same uh, you can observe for discrete time temporal graphs, um, but here you can um, also see that there is an optimal point uh, for most of them. And this point is uh, approximately um, at the point where the average uh, snapshot size would be. And this means uh, to the right of this uh, optim optimum, um, you would have the same problem as for continuous time, um, that yeah, your batch uh, contains multiple timestamps. And on the left side, it would be the other way around, that you uh, introduce an order that is uh, non-existent in the data because uh, multiple batches um, contain edges of the same timestamp. So to sum all of this up, um, we saw that the edge occurrence and the window durations um, of uh, many of the data sets we saw um, can vary substantially over time, uh, which leads to the problem uh, visualized here on the right that the yeah, batches contain different uh, time window durations. Um, the next point is that um, increasing batch sizes lead to less temporal information. And this means that if you would choose different batch sizes for different models, um, you would also get different tasks in the end. Um, the next point is that the NMI um, uh, is almost always uh, below one um, if you choose a batch size that is uh, larger than one. And even for batch size of one, it's not always one, um, as we saw before. And this means you always lose um, some information about the order of the edges. And for discrete time um, temporal graphs, we have seen that 
um, yeah, there is an optimal batch size um, where the NMI is also not one, but um, closer to it um, if you use the average snapshot size. And now with this, uh, the question arises, how can we better account for the temporal information? How can we fix all of these problems? And our solution um, is to, instead of evaluating the models using dynamic link prediction, to use link, what we call forecasting. And there, instead of using uh, batches with a fixed size, we use uh, time windows with a fixed duration. Um, yeah, this means that uh, the horizon that you choose um, is not a tunable parameter um, for the model, but instead part of the task definition you give in the beginning. Um, and yeah, also the number of edges would then worry, uh, vary between uh, different time windows, um, but this is not relevant. And here you can see the visualization from uh, our paper, um, where instead of the different sized windows that you would get with the prediction in the first uh, two lines, um, you would get, get um, windows that all have the same size, which would make the task much more consistent. The same is the case for discrete time. Um, yeah. And now we can uh, get to the experiments we did um, to uh, validate um, that uh, our task definition uh, indeed uh, yeah, fixes these problems. We did experiments using um, the DYGLib and also used the hyperparameters that they found in their evaluation. Um, we chose a batch size of 200 for dynamic link prediction and for um, dynamic link forecasting we chose a horizon that produces a similar average number of edges per batch to make the comparison as fair as possible between both approaches. Um, we trained the models only once and then did both evaluations on the same models with exactly the same weights um, so that the only difference is really the evaluation. And uh, as negative sampling procedure, we used uh, historical sampling. And here you can see the results. Um, the results, uh, the table here shows um, the AUC score um, for dynamic link forecasting uh, in uh, black. And then in parentheses, uh, in green and uh, red, you can see um, the relative change compared to link prediction. And uh, on the left side, uh, next to the name of the data set, you can also see the NMI score um, that you would get using a batch size of 200. And you can see that uh, especially for the models where the uh, NMI score is very low, which would mean that you would uh, lose a lot of uh, information um, about the order of edges in the batches. Um, there, the um, performance of the models uh, changes uh, a lot. Um, for discrete time temporal graphs, uh, we repeated these experiments, um, but there, instead of uh, yeah, choosing a different uh, a horizon that is close to um, the batch size uh, or to the number of edges in the batch uh, to the batch size, um, which shows a horizon of one, um, because there it is uh, natural to evaluate uh, each snapshot um, uh, sequentially. And uh, here you can see the results. And uh, here, the most uh, striking. Um, the uh, thing I would say is that uh, for the models that uh, have a memory, uh, which means that uh, can learn uh, even in the evaluation or yeah, not really learn, but um, uh, use the information that was given, um, we can see a, a substantial drop in performance. And we suspect that this is um, because of the information leakage um, that we talked about earlier. And using our approach, uh, this information leakage would be fixed 
um, which means that now the models could not use this information and thereby performed worse. Um, now, uh, for the evaluation, we used uh, Horizon um, that was very similar to the batch size um, that we used. Um, this is not uh, what should be done in practice. Um, instead, um, there is not really an optimal horizon that um, yeah, can be searched for, um, but instead uh, you should choose for your evaluation um, an, a specific horizon for each data set. Um, but the important thing is um, that you need to use the same horizon for all of the models. And you can choose this horizon um, yeah, based on um, different things, for example, research. Um, here on the right side, you can see um, a study from 2015 where they found that um, typically 90% uh, of all email replies are sent within 24 hours, which could mean that um, for the email data set, the Enron, um, you could choose 24 hours as a, a window duration. Another option would be just common sense, um, because at least I would consider it um, yeah, polite um, to answer in uh, 24 hours uh, to an email. Um, another option would be uh, to look at uh, task requirements. Um, here you can see a, um, a picture of the timetable for the buses uh, at the bus stop in front of our office. Uh, I'm sorry that it's in German, but I think uh, yeah the numbers uh, can be read in any language. Um, so you can see uh, on the far left and on the far right uh, the hours, and then in the uh, colored columns uh, the minutes, and uh, the bus at our stop comes uh, every seven to eight minutes. And this would mean that uh, if you want to um, yeah, predict or forecast um, if a bus gets canceled or delayed, then you should, um, for this specific uh, bus, uh, not choose a window duration that is uh, yeah, above this time, because then you would have the same edges uh, in a batch. Another option would also be to consider the data characteristics, um, for example, uh, um, yeah, weekly patterns of something else that you can observe. Um, here you can see, again, an example from before. Um, where I can, uh, I think you can uh, observe a very distinct uh, weekly pattern um, with uh, a lot of edges occurring uh, during weekdays and only some uh, appearing during the weekend. Um, you can also use um, different horizons um, to test your models. Um, yeah, this is maybe something that is done, uh, for example, for weather forecasting, where you have an hourly forecast, but at the same time also a daily forecast. Um, here you can see, as an example, a picture from the, um, the Apple weather app, um, where you have different um, forecasting horizons. And yeah, one uh, very natural horizon for discrete time uh, data sets is to just use um, each snapshot individually, um, which would mean a horizon of one in the respective uh, time resolution that um, uh, each of the data sets has. Yeah, and with this, um, we can come to the conclusion. Um, so we have seen that um, using dynamic link prediction um, as an evaluation um, for temporal graph neural networks makes um, at the same time the task too easy because of uh, information leakage uh, where, can, where the model can observe uh, a pattern and then use it to predict um, at the same timestamp. Um, but also the task uh, can be tuned to fit the model, um, while it should be the other way around, um, which makes the task too easy. But at the same time, uh, it also makes the task too hard because um, you lose a lot of information that the model uh, should ideally um, get, um, for example, the order of edges. 
And at the same time, um, yeah, the model has to uh, account for varying uh, time window durations, although uh, in reality, uh, it would only need to predict for a fixed um, duration. And yeah, to fix these problems, um, we proposed dynamic link forecasting as a realistic evaluation method, uh, which enables uh, still enables efficient parallel processing. Um, yeah, which was mainly the problem why uh, all of this occurred to um, enable batch-based processing. Um, but yeah, at the same time, all, our approach um, also loses some kind of information. Um, because you also um, batch uh, some of the edges together, um, but instead of a fixed amount of edges, you use a fixed um, time horizon of edges, um, where inside these time horizons, you would also lose the order. Um, so in the end, uh, you always have a trade-off between uh, efficiency and the temporal information loss that you have. And on this note, uh, I want to conclude my talk. Um, and I would be very interested to hear your opinions about this trade-off, because in my opinion, um, yeah, it is not discussed um, very much in current literature. And I think we need to do more in that direction. And with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you a lot for the nice presentation. Um, I think it's very clear on my end. I do have some questions, but are there some questions from the audience first? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask question as well. Uh, or you can type the question in the chat. So I guess I can get started first. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I so I think doing dynamic link forecasting does make sense. Um, however, I think fundamentally, when you do link prediction for temporal graph, uh, for both the link prediction and the link forecasting task, they are essentially trying to approximate the underlying process in the sense that what you actually want to know is basically when a certain link will appear in the future. I think that's the most difficult task. So instead of predicting over the next two hours if the link will appear or not, ideally the model should output a probability distribution over a future period. And then you can tell you roughly which period most likely it would appear, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that's kind of the ideal model. It should give you some sort of confidence on, like, I don't think this person will reply email tomorrow, but probably more likely the day after, considering now it's midnight for them and, you know, the time zone difference and so on and so forth, um, and this kind of information. Um, but yeah, so like overall, um, I think the, uh, the, the changes make sense. And for the experiments, how are you training the models? Are you training uh, them so in the forecasting tasks or are you training them both as the batch? Training. Um, so we don't uh, use any um, of the link forecasting for the training. Um, so our paper is uh, only about evaluation. So we um, use the um, training setup from the DYG lift standard, standard one, um, which uh, I think is um, one positive and one negative example, um, and then uh, back propagation. And then also um, choosing the hyperparameters based on dynamic link prediction. Um, because, so... yeah, because I think there are some concerns here in the sense that if your task evaluation is for forecasting and your training is trained with batch, then doesn't it introduce distribution shift for the model at test time? because you are changing the task technically. Because the model is trained for link prediction, but now you are testing it for forecasting, right? Yeah, but I, I think uh, this is uh, in general done with negative sampling, isn't it? Because uh, normally I think uh, during training, it's uh, just uh, random sampling. 
And then uh, during test time, you use uh, different ways of evaluating, like negative sampling or inductive sampling. Because mm -hmm. for for models like TGM, you would train an epoch, and then after the epoch, there's an update function. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, so for those that feel free, uh, like to go. Uh, so we are more in the like discussion phase. So you are training the batch, and then after the backprop you still need to update the model with the most recent information from this batch. And then you go into the next batch with this information in your node memory uh, and your memory state, and then use that to predict for the next batch during the training. So during training, it's actually the gradients are flowing for TGN at least, the, like the gradients are flowing from the previous batch, right? So it's actually a batch-based kind of gradient learning system. So actually, when you are training the model in this way, it's also disrupting the model's capability to learn the causal structure, as you mentioned, because the batch based, it kind of makes up the ordering, right? So yeah, yeah. you would okay. probably want to train the model in the forecasting sense and then test it on the forecasting to see if the performance is actually much better because the assumption would be that if you learn the correct causal structure during training, then you can apply the same in test time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, something for future work. So <laughs> that is uh, the next step to also um, see uh, what uh, kind of um, consequences and what kind of difference this, this makes during training. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so super interesting work. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? Okay, um, not so far. Uh, so yeah, so then we can wrap up the talk for today and uh, uh, let's thank uh, the speaker again for the nice presentation uh, and the discussion. Uh, and we'll be back next week at this time uh, for next week's reading group. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.